Welcome. It is so good to be with you again, to know that our sheltering God is sheltering all of us as we shelter in our own humble spots here and there, across towns and cities and plains. But it is good that we have this occasion this morning to come together, even just for a half hour out of this week to know the deep and good love of God. So welcome, strangers, friends alike, to our worship this day. Before we start uh, with our call to worship, I'd like to just take one moment and thank Reverend Diane Mix for filling in last Sunday. She did such a beautiful job and it's a gift to have fine colleagues like her. So having thanked her, let's begin with our call to worship this morning. Our God is a God of seaside breakfasts who knows the way to guide us out of our ordinary lives. So God, we invite you to take us by the hand this week and wipe our schedules clear, clear enough so that we have time to spend with those who truly need us and who truly need our attention. Challenge us to fish from the other side of our worries and turn our eyes ever toward the nets that we already hold in our hands, which you have filled with grace and wonder and mercy. Oh, let's celebrate that this day. Good morning. Today's scripture is from John 21, verses 1 through 14, from the New International Version. Jesus and the Miraculous Catch of Fish. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebediah, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there, with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Please join us in singing Jesus Calls Us or the Tumult. <laughs>
So I'm wondering if any of you have ever experienced something that the ancient church fathers and mothers called the dark night of the soul. It feels a little bit like being so many weeks into this pandemic where perhaps we've prayed every day and it feels as if God has God's hands over God's ears. It might be that the isolation or the loneliness has just gotten to you once or twice or many times. The dark night of the soul also can be about shame or fear or anger or the sense of having been abandoned. And I think that our reading this morning from the Gospel of John was meant in some ways to tend the dark night of the soul that the Apostle Peter might have been feeling. We begin the story in John's Gospel with an acknowledgement that we are meeting at the seashore of the Sea of Galilee with Simon Peter and six others of the apostles. And whether for a sense of meaninglessness or a lack of purpose or a sense that they're drifting since Jesus' death and resurrection, Peter has suggested that they just go back fishing. And so the early part of this story is about them pushing off from the sandy shore and spending a night doing what they were doing years before when Jesus walked along that same shore and called to them. And wouldn't you know that as the morning sun was rising, they looked across on that shore and saw a figure standing there. And the figure asked them a question. So, how's the fishing going? And then they couldn't avoid what had happened and telling someone what had happened because the truth of the matter was they hadn't caught a single thing all night long. So not only had they felt the lack of purpose about being a disciple these days without Jesus to guide them, but it was seemingly true that they'd also forgotten how to fish, which was their mainstay occupation. And he had just made it very clear by saying, oh, no fish? Well, then how about dropping your nets on the other side of the boat? And I can imagine that there might have been a moment of frustration because they likely had fished on both sides of the boat and out of the bow and the stern, looking for something, anything that night. And so I'm guessing with deep sighs, they picked up that great net and threw it over on the other side where, from where they had been fishing. And then, all of a sudden, I can see every muscle in both arms of every one of those seven men go taut as they felt the weight of that net pull them and the muscles in their back straining as they tried to drag in that net so incredibly full of all kinds of large fish that they could barely get it into the boat. And that disciple who Jesus loved was the first one to say, oh, perhaps that's Jesus. Maybe because of the bounty of what they were bringing in, it reminded him of that. But I'm guessing that Peter, who had been totally absorbed in all of a sudden finding all those fish, caught the excitement in the voice of that disciple. And having taken off his outer cloak, he put it on as quick as he could, leapt into the sea beside the boat, and swam to the shore to be the first ones 
to lay eyes on that figure. Could it be? Was it truly? And when he came to the shore, he saw there on the beach that ring of stones, that charcoal fire, and on it the bread and the fish. And I imagine Peter pausing for a minute and looking at Jesus because there was that other charcoal fire that Peter had stood before warming his hands and then goaded by the men around him and the maid servant, having been asked the question three times, do you know this Jesus? You do, don't you? And three times saying, I do not know him. I do not know the man. And so when Peter saw that fire, I think he was thinking, oh, the charcoal fire, the elephant in the room. I'm not going to get out of this conversation this time. And Jesus just looked at him and said, why don't you bring some of the fish you've caught this morning and we'll lay that on the fire as well. And Peter willingly left that scene with the fire and went back to the boat and brought more fish. And darned if that story just goes blank for whatever the conversation was that happened around that fire with those eight men that resurrection appearance morning. And so I'd like to invite you to just be a little creative in your imaginations this moment and imagine with me what might have been said. Because I could take a guess and be fairly certain of what didn't get said that morning. I don't think that Jesus said to all of them, you are going to be left in the outer darkness now for leaving me, abandoning me, disowning me, saying that you never knew me. I don't think Jesus said that. I also don't think that he preached to them that morning about how to be better men. And I don't think he said to them, that he would ever abandon them again. I think that he let them realize that he had come back to them with gifts, several gifts. The first gift being that he had showed them where to find that great hall of fish and that it happened to be immediately beside the boat where they were. I think he also gave them the gift of breakfast after a long night of toiling up unsuccessfully. And that as they smelled that fish and as they saw the charred marks on the chunks of bread and could taste that together, I have a feeling that they might have gone back in their conversation to a memory about the feeding of the 6,000, and how those five little barley loaves and two fish had been turned into enough and more than enough to satisfy the hunger, the soul hunger and the body hunger of 6,000 people with 12 baskets left over. And I think that they might have noticed that even Jesus' invitation to bring some of their fish to add to his fish was akin to an invitation to consider themselves partners again. Because you see, I think deeply what this story is about is the judgment that Christ brings post-crucifixion and post-resurrection. 
And that judgment is not a judgment unto hell. That judgment is not a judgment on our unworthiness. The judgment comes as gift, as certainty that we are loved beyond all measure and that Jesus knows that what we need in the moment of our keenest sense of darkness and failure and unworth and shame and fear is not to be cast out. That what we need is to be fed and tended and tended and fed and fed and tended. Nourished with the bounteous gifts and the deep love of Christ in order to simply have the energy to try again. And that energy is what Jesus gave them, whether by word or deed or the power of his presence alone or all of those together. He gave them enough energy to go out and found the church of Jesus Christ, a church who is so filled with grace that to this day we still come together in each other's dark nights of soul and we feed and tend and tend and feed. And I think Jesus said to all of them, go out and keep fishing. Draw everyone you know back to the bounteous love of God. And I think Jesus had every right to tell that to these born fishermen because that was what he did. That was his sole occupation, was to throw the net out over any of us whom he saw to be in need. And once we are enclosed in that net, he drew, our, drew them as he drew, draws us to him with all gentleness and gift giving, with all nurturing and nourishing, with all blessing of abounded and abundant love. And so, my friends, this day, if you, in the midst of this pandemic, have known that dark night of soul, don't be fearful of throwing your net over, feeling the strength of the gifts that give, have been given to you by Christ our Lord. And know that the charcoal fire has set the bread and the fish are ready to be eaten, and Christ stands with both hands open to nourish and tend that we might rise and try again. Let us be those who, of whom it is said they've just gone fishing. Amen. We gather both to hear the beautiful stories of Jesus, but we gather too for prayer, bringing in the whole community, needs and triumphs, joys and concerns. And I would offer you this day this prayer, inviting you to close this prayer time with me as we share in our Lord's Prayer. Let us be at prayer together. God, you are Lord of every one of our moments because you are grace itself. You have sent your child to become one with us and you gave him to us so that we might see you face to face. And when the rest of the world curses us or sets us aside or speaks somehow words to us to 
make us feel as if our lives are without merit. You notice us and raise us to new life. We are sustained by your feast, nourished in ways familiar and mysterious. When we look around, we see you walking by our sides, at times completely recognizable. And at other times, you appear just as easily in the stranger. So this day, open our eyes to your gifts and blessings. Urge us to sit by the fire and hear your call to stop at the doorways of the hungry and the tents of the homeless, to see, really see the isolated and grief-stricken, and remember we have gifts to bring them to. We have your fish, your bread, your love, your tending, and let us bring those gifts. And as we do, we ask this prayer, which you first gave us and taught us would always be enough. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, leading us not into temptation, but delivering us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are pleased that you have chosen to be part of our worship service here at First Congregational Church of Hampton, the church that has been proclaiming Jesus Christ in Hampton since 1638. We are a Christ-centered church with an inviting faith, a growing faith, and a serving faith, and we welcome you to join us in accomplishing this mission. We also encourage you to join in the wonderful worship of giving. You can give securely online or by check using the giving information on your screen. We are a praying church and we sincerely want to pray with you for any needs you may have. You may send those prayer requests to the church office by email, which is also on your screen. Again, we are happy that you have joined us in this service and hope that you will be part of our worship again soon. As we leave each other's company this day, and go into another week where we live by this powerful love of God, I would invite us to remember that God always goes before us, unrolling the road of love upon which we can travel and following in his footsteps. That God places beside us on both sides, friends, who come in love to journey with us. And that if we are fearful and see before us only a dark valley, love moves behind us and ever so gently nudges us forward into even the places we fear to tread. And then love blesses us from above so that before and behind and beside and below and above, we are round about, wrapped in the cloak of, of love, seamless and unable to be torn in two. Go, my friends, in this love and celebrate being those wonderful fishers of men and women wherever we go. Amen.